And being their friend is not as important as it is for them to believe that there is an absolute authority in this world that they must submit to. Now the trouble is we are either their friend and we give in, or when we become the authority we become harsh and angry and, and we create all this in bitterness. There is a better way. And I would encourage some of you who are sensing that to, to, to seek that out, to create that environment in your home. Thirdly, when we worship God for some of his attributes and not others, do we worship him the right God the wrong way? Let me say that again. When we worship God for some of his attributes and not others. In his new book, Futurecast, George Barna researches America's drift from clearly defined religious beliefs, which we used to have, toward face cut to fit our personal preference. And he asked a bunch of questions, a bunch of uh, uh, questions about church and religion. And all major trend lines of religious belief and behavior he measured ran down. They were receding, except for two. You'll love this. One... More people today claim they have accepted Jesus as their Savior and expect to go to heaven. Isn't that good? Isn't that, that, that exciting? So more people believe they're going to heaven than they ever have before. Second, more people said they haven't been to church in the past six months except for special occasions such as weddings or funerals. So our church involvement and attendance is down. Our belief in Jesus and going to heaven is up. Is something broken there. When he distilled that Jesus question down a little bit further, and he asked them this, he said, when he measured people by their belief in the seven essential doctrines as defined by the National Association of Evangelicals Statement of Faith, now that sounds crazy, I know, but it's essentially orthodox Christian doctrine that we as a church adhere to and believe ourselves, only 7% qualified. So we have a growing number of people who believe in Jesus, but only 7% of those interviewed believe in true orthodox doctrine as, an, as the general evangelical church of which we are an evangelical church would state. There is something broken. When people get to pick and choose who God is, following God is easy and everyone loves doing it. Why? Because it isn't really God that we are following or God that we are worshiping. Rather, it's our own perverted projection of what we think and desire God to be. Think about that. When you and I abandon the absolute truth of what God has said he is, and we kind of craft our God, we're not worshiping God, we're worshiping our projection of him. We're essentially, to some degree, worshiping ourselves. Because in our mind, we have said, no, I don't like this God. I don't like what he says about about purity. I don't, I don't like this guy. I don't like what he says about generosity. I don't like this guy. I don't like what he says about the poor. I don't like, and we, we manufacture, we create an ungodly God in our mind. That's our own conglomeration. And then we place him invisibly on the altar of our lives, and we walk through the doors of our church, and this is the God whom we worship. This is the God to whom we sing. This is the God to whom we pray. And we don't really let the true of God determine who God is. God knows our frailty. God knows that our heart is a factory of idols. It's just pumping them out. It's doing anything and everything it can to take control and authority away from God and give it back to us. That's where it started. That's where the problem started, and that's where what we struggle and, and wrestle against every day. And God knows this, which is why he gave us the command. Do not make any graven image of who I'm supposed to be, but worship me as I am. Worship me as my word says that I am. Let me be God. As we continue in this verse, it's really cool that after stating very distinctly what we can't do, he continues, and he says in Exodus 20, verses 5 and 6, For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, but showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love me 
and keep my commandments. God gives us this command to protect us because he loves us. He knows where a wayward heart will end up going. He wants to protect you. He wants to protect me. In fact, God, after a period of time, realized that we needed an image of some sort. So what did he do? He became the very image of whom we're supposed to worship in Jesus. The scriptures say that Jesus is who God would look like if God were human. Hello, he was human. He was Jesus. This is the person to whom we love and worship and follow and adore and align our life to. He gave us an image and he gave us his word to talk about and describe who this Jesus is supposed to be. The ultimate expression and greatest example of God's love was sending his son, Jesus Christ, to live on this earth, to be the image for us, and to die for our sins. When God did finally to take a, decide to take a form, he chose a humble Nazarene who would ultimately die on a cross. This is God. There is nothing short of this that we can worship. There is no image. There is no idea. There is nothing short of a cross and a humble, perfect Nazarene being sacrificed on it that we are called to follow and called to worship. We as Christians are not given images to worship, but we are invited to experience God and also to eat with him. This morning we're going to share communion. And when Jesus was about to go to the cross... He didn't just tell his followers. He didn't just say, okay, I'm going to go to a cross. When you see me, I'm the real God. You know what he said in in the, in the book of Luke? He says to his disciples, how I have longed for this meal with you. I, your God, the image bearer, I've longed for this meal with you. And then he gives it to them. And they share it with him. In Revelation 3.20, he says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any of you will hear my voice and open the door. He's talking to the church. He's saying, I will come in and eat with him and he with me. And here this morning we have an opportunity out of the love of God in Jesus Christ to help us, to correct us, to give us a clear view of who God is and who we're supposed to worship. We're going to take communion. I'd like to invite the ushers to go ahead and You can get the elements. We practice open communion here at Rooftop, which means if you hold to the orthodox view of of the Christian faith, have accepted Jesus in your Christ, in your heart, repented of your sins, and been baptized, we invite you to join us for communion. But when you take communion this morning, I want you to look at this bread and this juice as the closest image or remembrance that God gave us in our worship of him. This is what he left with us. He said, do this in remembrance of me. Let me pray. Father God, we... We thank you for the opportunity that you've given us. It's not a wooden statue. It's not a gold replica. It's not something that's been fashioned, but it's bread and wine, bread and juice that has been left behind as a symbol to point us to the true image bearer that we are supposed to worship, Jesus. And I pray that you would help us to put away these lesser gods, these lesser representations of you, and that we would more seriously, more fervently seek after you, the invisible God, and worship you and you alone and let you be God in our lives and do in us that which you need and want to do to make us into the image that we were created to be reflecting you and your glory. We ask your blessings on this communion time. Just pray that you will encourage our hearts as we share this together as a church family.